The night sky is dominated by darkness. Across the sky, many glittering sparks drift over our heads. We notice their beauty, but not much else. These dazzling pinpoints are not visible to our eyes. Observe they are true to nature. They are mysteries to our eyes. Since Galileo's time, humanity has sought to move beyond the scope of biology. Telescopes have opened the heavens to Earth, revealed the far reaches of the universe, and revealed galaxies cloaked in darkness. Hubble has achieved more than any other telescope to bring home the wonder and reality of the universe. Hubble was launched in 1990 by NASA and ESA. It orbits Earth 350 miles, or 569 kilometers above its surface. Due to its position, it can circle free of Earth's atmosphere, which distorts and blocks light from space. Ground-based telescopes are unable to match Hubble's pristine views. Every 97 minutes, the telescope whirls around the Earth, collecting light, much more light than our eyes can see alone. From the nature of storms on Jupiter to the distant galaxies of the universe, this light can reveal everything. Hubble sees structure where we see light points. Hubble sees detail where we see the haze. While we see darkness, Hubble sees the faint glow of the early universe. Astronomers have uncovered some of the most fascinating cosmic discoveries of our time thanks to Hubble's explorations and a host of new questions and puzzles that will be explored by future telescopes to push back the darkness. The Cosmos There are many puzzles in a universe. There are times when the things we cannot see are more important than what we can see. We use the visible to piece together the great mysteries of the invisible. Take the behavior of matter around black holes, for example. The mysterious, still unexplained phenomenon of dark energy is revealed by distant stellar explosions. The age of the universe is estimated by studying distant stars. Cosmology is the study of the universe's structure and context. We study how the universe functions as a whole, how it is currently and will be in the future, and how things within it form. Cosmology is a little like being inside a building, examining the switches and outlets we can see on the surface to determine the wiring inside. Space is a vacuum, but its objects are part of a larger structure, and astronomers must understand this structure's physics before understanding how the features function. Looking out at space is like looking back in time. Our location receives light from the farthest objects in the universe that left those objects billions of years ago, so we see them as they were then. How do we see these farthest objects when we capture their light? Most distant galaxies are more minor, irregular, and lack clearly defined shapes. Hubble could see these distant galaxies before any other telescope. After observing a nearly empty patch of sky for 10 days, astronomers turned Hubble on what appeared to be a roughly bare patch of sky. The team was taking a risk. Most Hubble observations take only hours, and the time was better used on less speculative projects. Hubble might not have been able to see the objects the astronomers hoped to find, because they were too faint or too small. The search yielded the now famous Hubble Deep Field image, containing 3,000 galaxies, large and small, amorphous and shaped, burning in the depths of space. Astronaut Hubble looks back in time. The farther Hubble gazes into space, the farther it gazes back in time. Recent surveys, such as Hubble's Ultra Deep Field HUDF, and the Great Observatory's Origins Deep Survey GOODS, provide images of vast collections of galaxies, including some that date back to when the universe's time was less than a billion years old. The Hubble Space Telescope teamed up with other observatories in the following years to study small patches of the sky in high-resolution long exposures and multiple wavelengths. 
This chart shows Hubble's most significant deep sky surveys and their covered regions. We can follow the evolution of the universe with images. The most distant parts of the visible universe are littered with tiny red dots, the shapeless building blocks of galaxies whose light has been stretched by the expanding universe into an infrared glow. As we move closer, we see galaxies colliding and merging, increasing growth. Further away, we see versions of the large, stately galaxies we know today. Seeing how galaxies have evolved can show how the universe we know today evolved from a uniform void to an uneven universe ready for stars and galaxies to form. Furthermore, the differences in these galaxies allow us to learn about the first stages of the universe, the part we can't see. There was already some structure when the galaxies formed, or the spread of matter would have been even. In contrast, we see the coalescing of groups of importance, small pieces that began, collided and merged. This Cepheid variable star in galaxy M100 doubles in brightness during each pulsation. We are being beamed down from the sky with the answers to the universe's age. We know the universe has been expanding since the Big Bang. So, if we can measure its size and rate of expansion, we can calculate its age. There is more to it than you might think. All estimates are based on the brightness of objects, since you can't extend a ruler to the stars. Cepheid variable stars are a particular type of pulsating star whose brightness cycles indicate their inherent brightness. Observers find Cepheid variable stars in galaxies by comparing their intelligence with how faint they appear due to their tremendous distances, to determine the distance to those galaxies. It's like judging a car's distance from you by judging the brightness of its headlights on a dark street. Cepheid variable stars enable astronomers to measure distances in space. Discover how pulsating stars serve as yardsticks for measuring the universe. Cepheid variables have been found in galaxies as distant as NGC 4603, 108 million light-years away. Their stars appear faint from Earth. It is complicated to distinguish the characteristics of the Cepheids found in NGC 4603. Cepheids were used to determine the distance to the galaxy. Up until Hubble, Astronomers could only narrow the universe's age down to 10 to 20 billion years, a measurement with 10 billion years of error. Hubble conducted a comprehensive study of 31 Cepheid variable stars, determining the current expansion rate and narrowing the universe's age down to its most precise point. In combination with measurements by other observatories, Observations of Cepheid variable stars in galaxies like NGC 4603 led to the estimate of 13.7 billion years old. With Hubble's observations, the universe's age changed from a vast range of possibilities to a precise number. It isn't just a matter of curiosity to know the universe's age. Having a timescale for the development of stars and galaxies will help refine our models of how the universe and everything in it formed. Numerous elements of cosmology were shaped by the actual age of the universe. Star and galaxy formation timelines required a period. Previous problems with the universe's age range have included things like stars thought to be older than the universe. We can now determine everything from the time needed for stars to die to how long it takes to produce elements such as carbon, nitrogen and oxygen, the ingredients we need to survive. A watershed epoch is shown on each side. From the Big Bang to the present, it represents the universe's evolution over 13.7 billion years. As a result of reionization, the light from the first stars burned off a fog of cold hydrogen. 
A later epoch quasar pumped enough ultraviolet light to re-ionize the primordial helium with the black hole-powered cores of active galaxies. Radio telescopes were first used to study some familiar cosmic objects, including the remains of supernovae, distant galaxies, and influential areas of star formation. The quasars in these images appear to emanate from one galaxy, left, and two galaxies colliding, right. There are 1.5 billion and 1.6 billion light-years between the galaxies respectively. The entity that appeared to be a star appeared to be nothing more than a light point. As quasars are so far away and their size is so tiny, about the size of our solar system, the fact that we can see them with a telescope makes them among the most luminous objects in the universe. As Hubble proved with its high resolution, there was actually a galaxy hidden behind the glare of the quasar. He contributed to the quasar mystery. The surrounding regions of a supermassive black hole heats up and releases enormous energy and light, creating a quasar. As a result of multiple galactic mergers, Hubble found quasars in the centers of galaxies colliding or brushing up against one another and in elliptical galaxies. Quasars may be lit up by these interactions and fed by the central black hole. Observations by Hubble have also led to the discovery that these brilliant galactic centers are powered by giant black holes. Quasars weren't the only ones involved. According to Hubble, almost all galaxies with bright active centers have supermassive black holes feeding on the galaxy's matter. Additionally, the mass of a black hole is closely related to the mass of the bulge of stars forming the center of the universe, indicating that the formation of a galaxy is closely related to that of its black hole. The study of these monstrous black holes raises many questions about the formation of galaxies and the structure of the universe. Why do some regions form galaxies with massive black holes and others include rather ordinary galaxies? Why does the black hole phenomenon exist over such a wide range of sizes? From giant black holes in galaxies to tiny black holes a few times the size of our Sun. Is the formation of quasars just a stage in constructing supermassive black holes? The universe began with a bang and has been expanding since then, increasing the distance between galaxies with time. For many years, astronomers contemplating the death of the universe considered two main scenarios. Either the universe would keep expanding forever, the galaxies gradually drifting apart, or it would stop growing and collapse in a big crunch. In the late 20th century, astronomers believed the universe would expand forever at a constantly decreasing speed, coasting like a car out of gas but never totally losing momentum. They began determining the rate of expansion. The brilliant stellar explosions known as supernovae could also be used to determine the distances to galaxies just as they were for Cepheid variable stars. However, supernovae can measure distances even farther than Cepheids because of their incredible brightness. Astronomers used Hubble's clear vision to find the very distant supernovae needed to calculate the universe's expansion rate. Hubble's observations, however, upended the conventional wisdom. The universe wasn't slowing down. A study of the properties of the supernovae Hubble had imaged revealed that the universe was expanding faster and faster as if it were being propelled. Understanding what is causing this acceleration will take time since it doesn't seem to be a part of the glowing matter we see. How could this be? Scientists have no idea. A previously unknown dark energy might be the cause but humans are only just beginning to understand the mysteries of this field. We must develop tests for a phenomenon invisible to us to describe and define dark energy until it is as clear as the stars in our own backyard. For now, 
Hubble continues to study the supernovae that might hold the key to unraveling this mystery. Dark Energy's Discovery Known as Type 1a supernovae, certain exploding stars constantly emit the same amount of light. As a result, their brightness is nearly the same. Type 1a supernovae vary in brightness because some are closer to us and others farther away. By comparing the apparent intelligence of the supernovae with their actual brightness, astronomers can calculate the distances to the supernovae. The distance to the galaxies where the supernovae occurred is also indicated. Astronomers believed the universe's expansion would slow down as the distances to faraway galaxies increased. Cosmologists can measure the universe's expansion rate at different times in the past based on the brightness of Type 1a supernovae. Hubble found that the most distant supernovae were dimmer than they should have been, indicating that they and their galaxies were farther away. This contradicted the hypothesis that the universe expanded constantly or slowed down over time. Only if the universe was growing faster could they make sense of their space. Scientists involved won the 2011 Nobel Prize for Physics for their discovery. The Science of the Galaxy Galaxies are islands of activity in a sea of emptiness, where the action takes place in space. We will never be able to travel far enough to see our Milky Way galaxy from the outside, composed of 100 billion to 400 billion stars. While we can observe the activity within our own galaxy and the interactions between galaxies far away, we can also watch the activity within our own galaxy. Hubble helped identify the sources of the universe's most powerful explosions, studied how galaxies formed and studied stars near the end of their lives. The universe is revealed in its most precise and visible form by our observations of galaxies. Through the study of galaxies, we can observe the dynamics of the cosmos and how things form and change. We observe dominant galaxies feeding off their surroundings and stars, created under the influence of galactic gravitational forces, and puzzle over the varied shapes galaxies take. The study of galaxies past and present is essential to understanding the forces that shape our existence. The minor solar system resides within a universe. The United States Air Force deployed a series of satellites to monitor gamma rays in the 1960s. After signing the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the United States wanted to watch for the telltale radiation emitted by nuclear blasts. The satellites immediately began detecting gamma-ray events, but the study ruled out the possibility of bombs. In reality, there was no connection between the bursts and Earth. Scientists further investigated and slowly realized they were witnessing explosions with the power of 10 million billion suns per day emanating from seemingly random points in the cosmos. Until then, the universe's most violent explosions had gone undetected. Gamma rays. What are they? Gamma ray burst 971214. This galaxy, located 12 billion light years from Earth, gave off a gamma ray burst in 1998 that was brighter than the entire universe for a few seconds. A release of energy of such a rapid and enormous magnitude had never been seen by astronomers before. The extreme events that produce gamma rays and why we look for them are explained by scientists. The Gamma Ray Burst of 080319b During a powerful gamma ray burst in 2008, this single object was as bright as 10 million galaxies for nearly one minute. The observations followed up on the mystery and concluded that the shots came from supernovae, explosions of massive stars that can produce a black hole or neutron star. Nevertheless, not all supernovae had gamma-ray bursts. What was the actual cause? 
observations by Hubble have revealed that many gamma-ray eruptions originate in bright star-forming regions with stars with low metal content. Currently, scientists know there are at least two kinds of gamma-ray bursts. There may be a difference between the process of creating a supernova from a star that has lots of metal and one with little. Stars with low metal content are thought to produce black holes when they die, while stars with high metal content form neutron stars instead. Gamma-ray bursts are often black hole birth announcements, if that's true. Gamma-ray bursts add another piece to the puzzle of supernovae. Because supernovae are one of the few methods astronomers have for measuring vast distances in space, understanding these titanic explosions is key to understanding the universe. Witnessing the explosion in action can help us determine how it happened. A neutron star is surrounded by gas and dust, all that's left after a supernova explosion. The neutron star N49 emitted a tremendous gamma-ray burst a decade before this observation. Tracing the history of the galaxy Gravitational pull can cause galaxies to collide and merge. Galaxies crashed more frequently in the early universe than today, and astronomers believe that these collisions are necessary for galaxies to grow and evolve. It is thought that our own Milky Way galaxy, along with Andromeda, has increased in size by absorbing smaller nearby galaxies. We can test this hypothesis by studying the ages, arrangements, compositions and speeds of stars in a galaxy. The simulation shows an entire galaxy collision sequence and compares the different stages of collision to those observed by Hubble in various galaxy pairs. A combination of simulations and high-resolution observations can help us to better understand these titanic crashes. Observations of 300,000 stars, young and old, in Andromeda's halo by Hubble. During Hubble's time, he observed the halo of the Andromeda galaxy, a region of stars located beyond the central galactic disk. Andromeda is the nearest large galaxy to our Milky Way, and while it has been observed from the ground frequently, Hubble's resolution allows it to be seen at an individual star level. Because halo stars develop early during galaxy formation, astronomers expected Andromeda's stars to be old. However, they found that the stars in the galaxy's outer regions range from around 13 billion to 6 billion years old. Andromeda would have eaten the smaller galaxies, bringing them into the Andromeda halo and making them their own stars. Based on Hubble's observations, all large galaxies have experienced galaxy mergers and interactions throughout history. Scientists have known for years that the Milky Way and Andromeda are headed toward one another, but it is still an open debate whether they will collide, brush against one another, or miss one another. One day, we'll be able to see that for ourselves. Hubble has revealed that the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy are directly colliding. The two mammoth galaxies will collide in four billion years, spinning together in a slow, massive dance, eventually combining into a single universe. The sideways motion of the Andromeda galaxy was observed by astronomers over five to seven years. Using Hubble observations, scientists predict the future of the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies. Based on computer simulations, the two galaxies are expected to collide in four billion years. Earth and its companion planets will not be affected by the collision, as the Sun is flung into a new region of the galaxy. The distance between stars is so great that there is little chance of stars striking each other when galaxies collide. Stars that are dying A planetary nebula is a unique and beautiful formation formed by gas heated by radiation from a white dwarf. Over about 30,000 years, 
mid-sized stars like our Sun eject their outer layers of gas into space, leaving behind their hot core, a white dwarf. Astronomers thought that dim shapes they saw through telescopes were related to planets in the early days of astronomy. We can see previously expelled material interacting with newly ejected material in Hubble's observations, showing that planetary nebulae are not formed in one dying breath, but in multiple outbursts. Many of these nebulae have been observed by Hubble today, and Hubble has observed many complicated and extraordinary shapes ranging from tunnels to interlocking rings. For example, the Cat's Eye Nebula consists of 11 bubbles of gas that appear from our perspective three-dimensional structure of the Helix Nebula visualization. From our perspective, planetary nebulae seem flat, but they're actually quite complex. There is evidence that the Helix Nebula consists of two nearly perpendicular disks. Although we still do not understand the dynamics that create such intricate structures in such a short time, each Hubble image helps us learn a little more about how Sun-like stars spend their final years. Solar-like stars produce carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and iron, which are indispensable for life as we know it in their cores. By studying their deaths, we can learn how these elements are spread throughout the universe. A star that is 8 to 25 times more massive than our Sun ends its life in another way by exploding in a tremendous explosion called a supernova, which may leave behind a neutron star or a black hole. Supernovas are the titanic explosions that end a star's life. The star's material is flung into interstellar space at millions of miles per hour during a supernova. The elements formed inside a star are scattered across the area in its lifetime to become part of future nebulae, principles and planetary systems. Their cores collapse and explode when they exhaust fuel, sending their outer layers racing into space. Astronomers last observed a supernova in our galaxy in the 1600s, when Europe was still settling in North America. In the large Magellanic Cloud, a supernova, one of the Milky Way's satellite galaxies, reached Earth in 1987. Hubble began monitoring the explosion from the first ringside seat ever for a supernova three years later when it was launched. Starburst from Supernova 1987A, 1994 to 2006. Supernova 1987A has been observed repeatedly by Hubble, which has seen rings and knots of gas brightening around the exploded star. Material unleashed by the stellar explosion illuminates a six trillion mile ring of gas around the dying star. Over two decades of watching the supernova progress have given us a better understanding of how these events unfold over thousands of years. A supernova in the making has also been observed by Hubble. A supermassive star more than 100 times the mass of the Sun or a pair of supermassive stars is Eta Carinae. It briefly became the second prominent star in our night sky in 1843. Hubble images revealed that the unstable star had released two lobes of hot gas before its eventual explosion. Scientists believe Eta Carinae's mass could lead to a hypernova that would outshine the entire galaxy. The elements denser than iron are produced by massive stars, and when they die, the material is ejected into space. Our solar system was once filled with material from supernovae as evidenced by your gold ring or titanium watchband. Eta Carinae, the doomed star. Eta Carinae, an unstable star, is expected to explode as a supernova someday. A 150-year-old outburst sent lobes of gas racing outward at 1.5 million miles per hour, 2.4 million kilometers per hour. Science of the Planets the Hubble Space Telescope has observed stars and planetary systems in formation 
examined the atmospheres of planets around distant stars and seen the destructive power of cosmic impacts. What happens on the surfaces of our nearest neighbors? Are there other places with populations that wonder at the skies as we do? As we gather more information about planets and discover new ones, our understanding of planet science expands. Having only nine worlds on our initial list, including Kuiper Belt object Pluto, is an insignificant sample from which to draw conclusions. The discovery of extrasolar planets, planets beyond our solar system, has stunned astronomers with the wide variety of planetary systems. Giant planets orbiting close to their home stars, planets in strange elongated orbits, even a planet that orbits two stars at the same time. Seeing planets within our solar system and beyond enables us to learn more about how these bodies came to be and our own planet. The birth of stars and planets. When clouds of gas and dust collapse, gravity pulls the materials together into a dense object surrounded by a spinning disk of leftover matter. It eventually erupts with jets of intense radiation trillions of miles long, traveling at 500,000 miles per hour, 800,000 kilometers per hour. Scientists are uncertain exactly how the jets form, but believe they result from magnetic fields rotating around the forming star. Astronomers could see jets before Hubble, but not star-forming disks. Hubble's vision enabled them to see both. It captured the first detailed images of jets and disks in the Orion Nebula in 1995. In the past decade, Hubble has taken many images of jets and found the first direct evidence that they originate at the center of the dusty gaseous disk from which the forming star is drawing its raw material. During star formation, the jets are thought to slow down the spinning disk so that more matter can accumulate on the star. The Orion Nebula in a Panoramic View The nebula contains 700 young stars in various stages of formation within a cavern of gas and dust. Astronomers once thought it would be impossible to observe protoplanetary disks, the disk of dust around stars that coalesce into solar systems. The disks were engulfed in giant clouds of gas and dust, making them difficult to discern. By identifying the dark plots of dense dust against the bright background of glowing nebulae, Hubble disproved this theory and found numerous protoplanetary disks. According to Hubble's observations, planet formation is influenced by the environment in which a star develops. The Hubble observations have also provided clues about the missing steps in our understanding of planet formation, such as how a disk of gas and dust evolves into individual planets that orbit newborn stars. Planets outside our solar system Exoplanet HD 189733b's evaporating atmosphere Many extrasolar planets have been discovered beyond our solar system. Ground-based telescopes have found most of them by looking for tiny wobbles in a star's motion caused by planets tugging at it or the slight dimming of light caused by a planet passing in front of its parent star. Hubble can provide insights into the planets that cause these light-blocking periods called transits. In addition, Hubble measures the amount of light passing through the atmosphere of the Earth, which allows it to determine the makeup of the atmosphere. Hubble has discovered atmospheres containing sodium, carbon and oxygen, and a world with a comet-like tail of hydrogen evaporating into space. In addition, the team detected the first organic molecule on an extrasolar planet. Methane in the atmosphere of a Jupiter-sized planet blisteringly close to its star. Space Telescope's ability to make these observations was a breakthrough, confirming and bolstering the idea that they could examine the atmosphere of far-flung planets and set the stage for current and future telescopes to continue this critical science.
Moreover, Hubble took the first visible light picture, something astronomers thought was impossible. Observations of Formalhout's dusty surroundings had led astronomers to suspect that the star might have planets since the early 1980s. An image of the dust belt around a star shows a tiny speck of Formalhout b, a planet approximately three times the size of Jupiter, that might be surrounded by a disk of dust and gas. Observations of the planet Formalhout by Hubble Scientists used coronagraphs to black out nearby light sources, including the star in the center of the image, to observe the much dimmer planet as it passes near a dust ring surrounding the star. Photographs taken years apart show the planet moving along its expected path. For the first time, Hubble observes a planet orbiting another star. Having suspected for years that planets may exist in other solar systems in the universe, the Hubble Space Telescope captures visible light images that provide the first evidence of these extrasolar planets. Scientists describe the discovery of Formalhout b, the first extrasolar planet captured on a camera in visible light. Techniques for finding planets Planets are microscopic compared to other objects in the universe. Moreover, they can be a billion times fainter than the stars they orbit. Astronomers have developed innovative methods to hunt planets in other solar systems since they are nearly impossible to see directly. Transit-based hunting When a planet passes in front of its parent star, it will cause the star to dim slightly as they block some of the light. Astrophysicists watch for these telltale changes in brightness. Radial Velocity Hunting The gravitational pull of a planet causes its star to wobble. Telescopes can detect this wobble by observing the starlight broken into a spectrum of colors. As the star wobbles, dark lines appear caused by light being absorbed by its atmosphere. Astrometry as a method of hunting a planet's gravity pulls its parent star out of place as it orbits. There is a possibility that a world is pulling on the star if it sways in a periodic rhythm. A telescope with exceptionally sharp vision can sometimes see the star moving back and forth in the sky. Using direct imaging for hunting Because the stars are so bright and the planets so dim, it's challenging to capture a candid image of an extrasolar world. A mask called a coronagraph can sometimes block enough of the star's light to pick up a planet's dimmer reflected light. Microlensing by gravitational force Whenever one celestial object passes in front of another, its gravity can bend and magnify the light behind it, making it appear brighter the closer star will brighten twice if it has a planet. Comet crashes into the solar system Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 plunged into Jupiter's atmosphere in 1994, sending large plumes of debris into space. A spectacular view of the event was provided by Hubble, who watched the comet approach the collision site. As Jupiter's gravity shattered the comet into dozens of fragments, it observed violent waves erupting from the impact sites. Scientists believed it was a once-in-a-thousand-years event. Astronauts visited Hubble in May 2009 to install new instruments. In July, an amateur astronomer discovered a strange dark spot on Jupiter's surface as engineers and scientists tested and adjusted the refurbished telescope. As a result of an unnoticed asteroid impact, an expanding impact site has been left behind. Once again, the big world has been hit. 1994 First Strike The first comet, P. Shoemaker-Levy 9, which fragmented upon impact with Jupiter, produced a plume near Jupiter's limb. It was an important event that couldn't be missed. Hubble's team temporarily rearranged its schedule to take pictures of the impact site with one of its new instruments. 
Impacts of Comets in Visible and Ultraviolet Light An asteroid struck Jupiter in July 2009, leaving a bruise the size of the Pacific Ocean. The Hubble Space Telescope observes different forms of light, allowing us to see more detail than we might otherwise. After a recent servicing mission, engineers interrupted the telescope's calibration to take a picture of the impact. As seen in visible light, Jupiter shows impact sites in its southern hemisphere. The same places on the planet are visible in an ultraviolet picture taken 20 minutes later. This image shows the comet's residue and materials thrown from Jupiter's lower atmosphere into its upper atmosphere by the impact since the fine particles are easier to see in ultraviolet light. The images were taken on July 17, 1994. Images of Jupiter's impact sites raise questions about the planet's composition. The properties of the waves racing outward from Shoemaker-Levy 9 sites, for example, indicate that the planet's design is less similar to the Sun than researchers previously thought. Hubble's advantage is its ability to take high-quality images of such events on short notice, enabling us to deeply study our cosmic neighborhood. Given the short interval between results, one may wonder if these impacts are as rare as once assumed. Perhaps the timing of these incidents is coincidental, or perhaps collisions occur more frequently than we thought. Scientists once thought they had implications in our solar system that occurred thousands of years apart. NASA's Space Telescope Since the dawn of astronomy, astronomers have shared one goal – to see more, see farther, see deeper. Humanity made one of its most significant advances in that journey thanks to the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope in 1990. The Hubble Space Telescope is one of NASA's most successful and long-lasting science missions. It is located above the atmosphere. It views the universe typically much better than ground-based telescopes. It has relayed hundreds of thousands of images back to Earth, shedding light on many of the great mysteries of astronomy. Named after a legend Dr. Edwin Powell Hubble an astronomer who made some of the most important discoveries in modern astronomy is the name of the Hubble Space Telescope. Working with the most advanced technology at the Mount Wilson Observatory, Hubble showed in the 1920s that some of the numerous distant faint clouds of light in the universe were entire galaxies, much like the Milky Way. It changed the way astronomers viewed our place in the universe forever when they realized that the Milky Way was only one of many galaxies. Hubble's most important discovery came when, in 1929, he discovered that galaxies appear to move away from Earth faster the farther from Earth they are. The Big Bang theory posits that the universe began with a burst of energy at a single point and has been expanding ever since. Hubble Space Telescope Cross-Section Hubble travels at about 5 miles per second, 8 kilometers per second, fast enough to cross the country in about 10 minutes during its orbit around Earth. Hubble's mirror captures light as it travels and directs it into its sun's instruments as it does so. A Cassegrain reflector telescope, such as Hubble, is a type of telescope. The main mirror or primary mirror reflects light. After being reflected by the primary mirror, the light is reflected by a secondary mirror. Using the secondary mirror, light is focused through a hole in the primary mirror which is connected to the telescope's science instruments. It is a common misconception that the power of a telescope lies in its ability to magnify objects. A telescope works by collecting more light at a higher resolution than the human eye can see. The larger a telescope's mirror, the more light it can hold and its vision is better. Hubble's primary mirror measures 94.5 inches, 2.4 meters. It is smaller than current ground-based telescopes, measuring 400 inches, 1050 centimeters. But Hubble's location beyond the atmosphere 
gives it remarkable clarity. Following the light's capture by the mirror, Hubble's science instruments work together or individually to provide the observations. These instruments probe the universe in different ways. Hubble's functions are all powered by sunlight. Solar panels on Hubble convert sunlight directly into electricity. When the telescope is blocked from the sun's rays, some electricity is stored in batteries in Earth's shadow. Design of the Hubble Space Telescope Wide Field Camera 3 WFC3, detects near-ultraviolet, visible and near-infrared light, but not all at once. It is now Hubble's leading and most efficient camera. COS is a spectrograph that sees exclusively in ultraviolet light. Like prisms, spectrographs separate light from the cosmos into their component colors. A wavelength fingerprint provides information about an object's temperature, chemical composition, density, and motion. Advanced Camera for Surveys ACS, sees the light in wavelengths from the far ultraviolet to near-infrared and is designed to study some of the earliest activity in the universe. ACS identifies the most distant objects in the universe, searches for massive planets, and examines the evolution of galaxies' clusters. NICMOS is Hubble's near-infrared camera and multi-object spectrometer. The Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph STIS, is a spectrograph that sees ultraviolet, visible and near-infrared light and is known for its ability to spot black holes. COS can map out small objects like stars and quasars, but STIS can map out larger objects like galaxies. Working with Hubble's instruments Hubble's primary camera, WFC3, imaged NGC 6302 in ultraviolet and visible light with various filters to determine the properties of the nebula gas. It can observe objects hidden by interstellar dust, such as stellar birth sites, and peer into the deepest reaches of space using light which humans perceive as heat. Known as Fine Guidance Sensors FGS, these sensors keep Hubble pointed in the right direction by locking onto guide stars. They can be used to measure stars' positions and motions precisely. Large Space Telescope Concept Art In 1923, German scientist Hermann Oberth, one of the founders of rocketry, proposed blasting a telescope into space aboard a rocket. Lyman Spitzer Jr., an American astrophysicist, proposed a space observatory in 1946. During the next 50 years, he would devote himself to making this space telescope a reality. In 1969, NASA approved what was then called the Large Space Telescope Project. The original proposal was downsized to stay within budget, reducing the size of the telescope's mirror and the number of instruments it would carry. The team working on the project proposed a telescope with several interchangeable instruments. The telescope would either be returned to Earth for repairs and replacement instruments, or serviced in space in orbit. Legends are made of this. Several decades before the Hubble telescope became a reality, legendary scientists considered the possibility of a space observatory. The European Space Agency ESA, and NASA began working on a plan that eventually became the Hubble Space Telescope in 1975. To supply NASA with manpower and funding, ESA's support was crucial. NASA would provide the solar cells and one of the telescope's instruments, the faint object camera. Congress approved funding for the telescope in 1977, after being reassured by the partnership. NASA centers and companies like Lockheed Missiles and Perkin Elmer Corporation began working on the Hubble telescope piece by piece. The astronauts trained in a weightlessness tank in 1979 using a mock-up telescope to simulate Hubble Space Telescope construction. Lockheed Missiles and Space Company, Lockheed Martin, 
diagram of the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble was scheduled to launch in October 1986. Tragically, the launch was delayed until January the 28th. Just over a minute after liftoff, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded. Shuttle flights were suspended for two years. The telescope parts were stored. During the delay, Hubble workers continued improving solar batteries and upgrading other systems. Hubble was launched into orbit on April 24, 1990, aboard Space Shuttle Discovery. Five instruments were carried by the telescope. The Wide Field Planetary Camera, the Goddard High Resolution Spectrograph, the Faint Object Camera, the Faint Object Spectrograph, and the High Speed Photometer. Designed to be repaired and upgraded by astronauts in orbit, it would be needed sooner than later. Starting off on the wrong foot It was clear almost immediately that something was wrong after Hubble entered orbit. The pictures were more explicit than those of ground-based telescopes, but they were not the new images promised. The photos were blurry. In Hubble's primary mirror, Polished so carefully over an entire year, there was a flaw called spherical aberrations. The mirror was just slightly the wrong shape, which caused the light that bounced off the center of the mirror to focus differently from the light reflecting off the edge. This flaw, about one-fiftieth the thickness of a sheet of paper, was enough to distort the view. Hubble was the first instrument to come with built-in corrective optics. Scientists and engineers were faced with a well-known problem. Astronomers had been dealing with spherical aberrations since Galileo's time, but Hubble's mirrors could not be altered or replaced while in orbit. Fortunately, a solution was found. Mirrors could be used to intercept the light that reflects off the mirror, correct for the flaw, and bounce it to the telescope's science instruments. COSTAR, or Corrective Optics Space Telescope Axial Replacement, could be installed in place of one of the telescope's other instruments to correct their images. In addition to replacing the Wide Field Planetary Camera, astronauts will install the Wide Field and Planetary Camera 2, WFPC2, containing small mirrors to correct aberrations. As scientists and engineers worked, Hubble sent back images that, despite their flaws, still gave astronomers a better look than they'd previously had at the kind of cosmic phenomena Hubble was intended to reveal. Scientists developed new image processing techniques that partially recovered some of the information lost due to blurring. A planet-spanning storm churned on Saturn. The number of stars in galaxy M87 revealed the scale of the supermassive black hole at its center. The lobes of gas emitted by the unstable, explosive supermassive star Eta Carinae were observed. The science Hubble accomplished with the problematic optics hinted at what could be accomplished with a fixed mirror. One of the most complex space missions was trained for 11 months by astronauts and NASA staff. Over 100 specially designed tools would be used in the repair process. It would be the first test of the telescope's vaunted capability of being serviced and repaired in space and its critical nature. The Space Shuttle Endeavour launched seven crew members into orbit on December 2, 1993, for a mission that involved five days of spacewalks and repairs. The high-speed photometer was replaced with COSTAR, the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 replaced the original Wide Field Planetary Camera. They also replaced solar panels, fuse plugs and other hardware. They were finished on December the 9th. Training for the first servicing mission The Neutral Buoyancy Simulator simulates weightlessness by filling a vast water-filled tank with water. A view of the Indian Ocean shows the Space Shuttle Endeavour approaching the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA released the first images taken by Hubble's fixed optics on January 13, 1994. The photos were gorgeous, the resolution was excellent. Hubble finally became the telescope that had been promised. Pillars in the Eagle Nebula, M16A, one of Hubble's most famous images. Hubble's 1993 servicing mission 
was the first of many successful attempts to upgrade the telescope. Hubble received two gifts from the Space Shuttle in 1997, two instruments that featured technology not available when scientists designed and built the original equipment. New appliances gave Hubble a broader view of the cosmos, a pattern that repeated itself in the years that followed as astronauts brought Hubble improved technology. Astronauts would visit Hubble in 1997, 1999, 2002 and 2009. Three of Hubble's six gyroscopes had failed, and Hubble needed at least three to observe a target. In November 1999, a fourth gyroscope failed, forcing Hubble into safe mode. Hubble was protected, but could not keep its targets. In December 1999, Servicing Mission 3A was launched, followed three years later by Servicing Mission 3B. In seven months, we developed, approved and executed an urgent call-up mission. In Servicing Mission 3A, astronauts replaced all six gyroscopes and installed more powerful electronics, batteries and new insulation. Hubble's Advanced Camera for Surveys ACS, and a new power control unit was installed for servicing Mission 3B. It was a delicate mission. Hubble had to be turned off for the first time since its launch to replace the power unit. The mission went well, and ACS, with its wide field of view, superb image quality and exquisite sensitivity, brought ten times more discovery power than the camera it replaced. An astronaut visit to Hubble in May 2009 was the culmination of a long effort to provide one more servicing mission to the telescope. The mission was initially scheduled for 2004. The view from Hubble improves over time. A Hubble image of a small region of the Orion Nebula reveals how the telescope's vision has improved over time. Hubble's fourth servicing mission was perhaps its most challenging and intense. As a result of the loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia, the mission was postponed until May. NASA approved a second shuttle mission after restarting the shuttle program and re-examining the risks. Two weeks before the launch of the task in late September 2008, a malfunction occurred in a system that controls science instruments and directs data flow within the telescope. The problem was resolved by switching to a backup plan, but NASA was unwilling to leave the telescope without a spare. ACS and the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph STIS, had already stopped working because of electrical malfunctions in 2007 and 2004. As part of servicing Mission 4, Astronauts installed a replacement data unit and performed on-site repairs for two failed instruments that had never been imagined by telescope creators. During spacewalks, astronauts had to crack into the interior of the instruments, replace components and reroute power. In addition to Hubble's nail-biting repairs, two new advanced instruments, the Wide Field Camera 3 WFC3, and the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph COS, gave Hubble five tools for future observations. Hubble's latest workhorse instrument, WFC-3, is susceptible and efficient, and it is capable of taking ultraviolet, optical and infrared pictures. The COS Spectrograph examines nearby stars, distant galaxies and gas and dust. Space Shuttle Atlantis and the STS-125 crew launched on the final mission to upgrade Hubble on May 11, 2009. At first, NASA hoped Hubble could be brought back to Earth by the end of the task. Since SM-4 is likely to be the last astronaut mission to Hubble, astronauts installed a new device, the soft capture mechanism. In the future, when Hubble reaches the end of its life, a robotic spacecraft could attach itself to this device and guide it through its descent into Earth's atmosphere. Hubble will eventually cease to exist. Over the years, Hubble's components will gradually degrade to the point that the telescope stops functioning. When that happens, Hubble will continue orbiting Earth until its orbit decays 
allowing it to spiral toward Earth. Getting ready for the future While the shuttle released Hubble back into space in 2009, an imaging system called the Relative Navigation System, RNS, acquired images and video of the telescope's aft bulkhead. The artist's depiction shows one of the RNS cameras collecting data. Having this information will allow NASA to explore many options for a safety orbit of Hubble. The replacement vehicle is unlikely to be able to return Hubble to Earth because it was explicitly designed to function with the Space Shuttle. Robotics will be used to help deorbit Hubble, guiding its remains through the atmosphere and into the ocean. Hubble's legacy, discoveries, trailblazing design and success in showing us the universe in unprecedented detail will live on. Researchers will rely on Hubble's discoveries for years as they continue to understand the cosmos, a pursuit that has gained clarity, focus and triumphs through Hubble's wealthy existence. Astronomical exploration of the universe will not end with Hubble's eventual demise. The James Webb Space Telescope, a successor to Hubble, will be the next giant observatory in space. The Webb Telescope, which will see infrared light, and the Hubble Telescope visible light will be tennis court-sized telescopes orbiting far beyond Earth's moon. The James Webb Space Telescope – Beyond Hubble In addition to the Hubble Space Telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope is NASA's next orbiting observatory. Webb will navigate through a frigid void nearly a million miles from Earth and peer back to when the universe was first illuminated by stars and galaxies. A stellar jet in Carina – visible versus infrared Observations taken by Hubble in visible and infrared light reveal dramatically different and complementary views of an object. As Webb scans the cosmos, he will be looking for invisible radiation called infrared. Our ability to see infrared light is crucial to understanding the universe. The furthest objects we can detect are seen in infrared light. More spectacular objects that would otherwise be invisible emit infrared light, and infrared light passes through clouds of dust to allow us to see their depths. As Hubble sees visible light, Webb will see infrared clearly and precisely. Our view of a telescope is quite different from Webb's. This spacecraft has no tubes, only a tennis court-sized sunshield that blocks light from reaching its cold side, which houses its mirrors and science instruments. A box would interfere with faint infrared radiation going Webb's mirror and devices by trapping heat. The Webb Telescope's two-story high primary mirror is made of 18 segments of beryllium, which can withstand the extreme cold it will have to endure, minus 233.3 degrees Celsius. Webb will be the world's largest telescope. The primary mirror of the Webb Telescope is too large to be monolithic, like Hubble's 94.5-inch, 2.4-meter mirror. Thus, its mirror is divided into 18 precisely ground and polished hexagonal segments. The giant telescope will have to be folded up inside the rocket that carries it into space. The mirror will unfold as it approaches its destination, and the sunshield will spread like wings. The vision of Webb will be able to detect features. Through Webb, Infrared light will be visible because it will be stretched as it travels across space, a phenomenon known as redshifting. This will enable scientists to see the light from the first galaxies formed in the early universe. Infrared views from Webb will enable us to see through opaque clouds of gas and dust in our own galaxy to objects like newborn stars and dusty disks forming new solar systems allowing us to better understand how stars and planets evolve. Webb's instruments will allow us to detect traces of water vapor from planets around other stars, possibly indicating the presence of life-giving oceans. Targets for Webb Science With Webb now in operation, and despite the high expectations for the telescope, 
the real excitement will come from Webb's discoveries. This simulated image shows what deep field photos will look like with Webb. Far-reaching galaxies reveal new galactic populations. Astronomers will have an unprecedented tool to explore the cosmos once Webb takes its place among the stars. The science it reveals may, as with Hubble, lead to questions astronomers haven't considered yet. Webb's true strength may lie in its potential for unbounded, unexpected discovery. A cluster of stars, NGC 2074, in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Hubble observed a small nebula region near the star cluster NGC 2074, upper left. It is a firestorm of raw stellar creation, possibly caused by a nearby supernova explosion. The galaxy is about 170,000 light-years away near the Tarantula Nebula, one of the most active star formation regions in our local group. In the 3D image, we see dramatic ridges and valleys of dust, serpent-headed pillars of creation, and filaments of gas glowing under torrential ultraviolet radiation. It lies on the edge of a dark molecular cloud that is an incubator for new stars. Clusters of hot young stars born in NGC 2074 are eroding the nebula's wall with high-energy radiation. Another young collection may be hidden under a circle of brilliant blue gas at the bottom center. Another young cluster may be hidden. Retina Nebula A seemingly square nebula, dying star IC4406. Is it possible to make a square nebula form a round star? The conundrum is revealed when studying planetary nebula like IC4406. IC4406 is likely a hollow cylinder whose square appearance results from our vantage view. IC4406 probably looks like the ring nebula when viewed from the top. Combining images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 2001 and 2002, this color composite picture represents the Hubble Space Telescope in representative color form. The cylinder's ends are filled with hot gas, while dark dust and molecular gas line its walls. Within the planetary nebula's center is the star that created this interstellar sculpture. IC4406 will be nothing more than a fading white dwarf star in a few million years. NGC 3603 – Star Cluster Stellar Jewel Box is one of the most massive young star clusters in the Milky Way galaxy. Within the giant nebula NGC 3603, there are thousands of sparkling young stars. About 20,000 light-years away, NGC 3603 is a prominent star-forming region in the Carina spiral arm of the Milky Way. In this image, a young star cluster is surrounded by a vast area of dust and gas. It shows the stages of star formation. Sir John Herschel discovered the nebula in 1834. It spans roughly 17 light-years. Composite image of SNR 0509-67.5 taken with optical and X-ray imaging. A combination of data from two of NASA's great observatories was used to make this image of supernova remnant 0509-67.5. Hubble Space Telescope images of SNR 0509-67.5 and its surrounding star field are combined with Chandra X-ray Observatory images. We see a soft green and blue hue of heated material surrounding the glowing pink optical shell based on the X-ray data. This is a result of ambient gas being shocked by the expanding blast wave from the supernova. Bright areas of the X-ray data correspond to ripples in the shell. Eagle Nebula Gas Pillars Messier 16. M16, or the Eagle Nebula, contains these towering tendrils of cosmic dust and gas. In this stunning Hubble image, 
The pillars of creation are part of an active star-forming region in the nebula and hide newborn stars within their wispy columns. It is not Hubble's first image of this iconic feature of the Eagle Nebula, however, it is the most detailed. Located just outside the frame, a cluster of young stars emits scorching ultraviolet light that bathes the pillars in light. Blue represents oxygen, red represents sulfur, and the green represents both nitrogen and hydrogen in the image. Winds from these stars are slowly eroding the towers of gas and dust. As a fascinating but relatively minor feature of the Eagle Nebula, which spans 70 by 55 light years, the pillars of creation span approximately 4 to 5 light years in length. The nebula was discovered in 1745 by Swiss astronomer Jean Philippe Loy de Chasseur, located 7,000 light years from Earth in the constellation Serpens. The Eagle Nebula can be seen through a small telescope and is best viewed in July when its apparent magnitude is 6. A large telescope and ideal viewing conditions are required to resolve the pillars of creation. The star-forming region S106 IRS4, a massive star, is beginning to spread its wings. About 100,000 years ago, material streaming from this newborn star formed the nebula dubbed Sharpless 2106 Nebula, S106, shown here. This nebula has an hourglass or butterfly shape due to dust and gas orbiting infrared source 4, IRS4, visible in brown near the image center. Gas near IRS4 emits light after ionization, while dust far from IRS4 reflects light from the central star and functions as a reflection nebula. An infrared image of S106 reveals hundreds of low-mass brown dwarf stars buried in the nebula's gas. About 2,000 light-years away, S106 lies in the constellation of the Swan, Cygnus. The remnant of the supernova SN1006 Ancient supernova explosion creates a ribbon of light. A new star appeared suddenly in the sky in 1006 AD, witnessed and recorded by observers from Africa to Europe to the Far East. For several weeks, people could see the star without any aid during the day, and it remained visible for about 212 years before it faded away. This was probably the brightest star ever observed by humans. Scientists now know the object's true identity. SN1006 was a supernova that occurred about 7,000 light-years from Earth in the constellation Lupus. Over a thousand years, the stellar explosion sent a blast wave racing through space at nearly 20 million miles per hour. Gas and dust in its path are being swept up and heated by the blast wave. There is a nebulous bubble about 60 light years across surrounding the explosion site of this supernova. The star forming region 30 Doradus. At 160,000 light years away, the Tarantula Nebula 30 Doradus is a bright and active star forming region outside the Milky Way galaxy. 30 Dor contains the central cluster NGC 2070, the most dynamic region R136, which appears in the central right part of the image. This galaxy is a few million years old and contains thousands of young stars, including several of the largest. Bright blue stars are visible in the cavity excavated by stellar winds. Some redder stars are still embedded in the cloud material, seen in shadow except where illuminated by cavity stars. The embedded stars are more clearly visible in the infrared Hubble view due to the intervening cloud material. There is a nearby galaxy called NGC 602. Young stars in the small megalanic cloud are spewing radiation, eating away at the gas and dust cloud that gave birth to them. 
That scene can be seen in this Hubble image taken with the advanced camera for surveys. NGC 602 is a cluster of blue stars that developed when a large part of the gas cloud collapsed under gravity and became very dense. These hot young stars are currently producing fierce radiation sculpting the inner rim of the gaseous nebula. The nebula's parts resist erosion better than others, leaving tall pillars that point toward the stars, the radiation source. It's relatively close to us, less than 200,000 light years away, so it gives astronomers a chance to study star formation in a different galaxy. Additionally, it's a dwarf galaxy with fewer stars and lacks the enriched gas that more giant galaxies like ours possess. Therefore, it may provide a glimpse into what star formation might have been like in the early universe, NGC 6357 and Pismis 24. What is the maximum mass of an average star? Based on distance, brightness, and standard solar models, one star in the open cluster Pismis 24 was estimated to have more than 200 times the mass of our Sun, making it one of the most massive stars ever discovered. This star is the brightest object above the gas front in the featured image. However, the Hubble Space Telescope has revealed that Pismis 24-1's brilliant luminosity is not derived from a single star but from at least three stars. Component stars would still be among the most massive stars on record, with masses close to 100 solar masses. Stars are still forming in the emission nebula NGC 6357 at the bottom of the image. A spectacular cocoon of stars appears to be breaking out of what seems to be a Gothic cathedral. A Triffid Nebula Charles Messier discovered the M20 in 1764. It is a star-forming nebula located 9,000 light-years from Earth in the constellation Sagittarius. M20, also known as the Triffid Nebula, has an apparent magnitude of 6.3 and can be seen with a small telescope. This is the best time to observe it. Hubble's image shows the center of the Triffid Nebula with its three wing-like bands of thick dust. Near the nebula center, we can see a group of recently formed massive bright stars. UV radiation from these stars dramatically influences the structure and evolution of the surrounding nebula. Star formation does not occur near these bright stars anymore, because radiation has blown away the gas and dust from which new stars can form. As a result of the camera's design used to take the exposures, the image has a stair-step appearance. One of the four light detectors provided a higher resolution, but it had a smaller field of view than the other three. Black regions were left when the images from all four detectors were combined because the detector with the higher resolution did not cover as much area as the others. Small Magellanic Cloud Infant Stars For the first time, Hubble astronomers have identified a population of infant stars in the Milky Way satellite galaxy, the Small Magellanic Cloud, SMC, located 210,000 light-years away. Hydrogen fuel has not yet been ignited to sustain nuclear fusion. Its exquisite sharpness revealed a population of infant stars embedded in the nebula NGC 346 that are still forming from gravitationally collapsing gas clouds. The smallest of these infant stars is only half the mass of the Sun. Though star birth is common in our galaxy's disk, this smaller companion galaxy is more primitive, as it lacks much of the heavier elements forged in successive generations of stars through nuclear fusion. As primitive building blocks of more giant galaxies, fragmentary galaxies like the SMC are considered primitive. When the universe was much younger, these galaxies were most common. 
the SMC offers a unique opportunity to study how stars formed in the early universe. The nebula NGC 346, nestled among other starburst regions within the small galaxy, contains more than 2,500 infant stars.